Here's our gravitational wave sensitivity graph. I've included several of our equal mass merger examples, and I've added the frequencies that correspond to the wavelengths in order to highlight the gravitational wave spectrum. Also, note the expanse covered by the two axes. The strain is always a small number, but the top value of 10 to the minus 6 is a billion trillion times larger than the lower value of 10 to the minus 24. And the wavelength goes from a thousand meters on the far right up to the diameter of the visible universe on the left. This large extreme covers the gravitational waves created at the time of the Big Bang. They have been stretched by the expansion of the universe for over 13 billion years. Here's the range for supermassive black hole mergers. They produce a huge burst of gravitational waves at millihertz frequencies, detectable throughout most of the known universe. Here's the range for supermassive black hole mergers with stellar mass black holes and neutron stars. Here's the range for stellar mass black hole mergers with stellar mass black holes and neutron stars. Here's the range for stellar mass black hole mergers with stars. Here's the range for white dwarf mergers. These would only be detectable if they happen in our galaxy. And here's the range for rapidly spinning neutron stars with an uneven mass distribution. It's the angular acceleration of uneven mass components, such as a mountain on the surface, that produces the detectable gravitational waves. The green area above the detectability line is for the millions of non-merging supermassive black hole binaries in galaxy centers. They create theoretically detectable gravitational waves, but there are too many of them to distinguish one wave from another. This makes their individual signals unresolvable. At the lower end, this would include non-merging binary white dwarf stars in the Milky Way. We'll now turn our attention to how we can go about detecting these waves.